Hey, this is Brett, and you're watching Brett and Some Books. Today we are continuing Boxcar Bertha, and we are on chapter 11. Please like and subscribe. There were 20 women ahead of me. We moved slowly. No one paid any attention to anyone else. We were like a row of automatons, moving forward to something which held neither interest nor pleasure nor hope for us. I finally stood inside before a desk. Were you ever here before? The man at the desk inside asked. No, I answered. Go upstairs and register, he said shortly and turned to the next in line. Upstairs, I was asked if I could write and was told to sit down and fill out a registration card. After I had done so, I handed it to the clerk and she gave me a small blue identification card, also a small metal tag with my bed number on it to be hung around the neck while bathing or sleeping. I found the line into the dining room and sat down to eat a palatable beef stew, three thick slices of bread, a tin cup of tea with milk, and a dish of stewed apricots. We waited in silence and then sat around in the dining room until our names were called. At the bundle cage, a matron asked me a number of questions. Are you looking for a job? What can you do? Do you want to do housework? We can get you a job. No, thank you, I answered her. I think I can get a job for myself. Just leave your purse here. I handed it over to her. I had paid for my own food while I was with father, and I had sent some money to mother so that I had only a little money left. When all had deposited their purses and possessions, the whole line started for the bathroom, as baths were compulsory. Our clothes were placed on hangers and fumigated. We were given nightgowns. In the bathroom, I had a chance to see my fellow guests. The most startling thing was that the bulk of them seemed old women. All about me were sagging, misshapen bodies, stringing gray hair, faces with experience written deeply in them, tired, lusterless eyes. The average age, I found out later, was between 40 and 50, but most of these women looked much older. Together, they appeared all middle-aged, hard-working middle or housewives. Certainly, none of them looked like criminals. The majority of them were Irish and Irish-American. About 10% were black, and there was a sprinkling of Polish, Lithuanian, and English. A few showed signs of drink. A number showed to be sisters of the road, all bore the marks of poverty. Most of them were talkative and friendly. Half of them told me they were widows. At least one in four told the same story. Our home was broken up. My husband lost his job. We couldn't pay to rent in the old man's and the men's side next door. Some had been there only a few days, others for months. Most of them came periodically. When they got a job, they would leave, and when it failed, they came back. Between jobs, they looked upon the municipal lodging house as a home. I heard no dramatic, tragic stories. They accepted without resentment the fact that they were the product of the system, a society that hires and fires, a society in which landlords must have their rent. There were only a few like me who didn't need the place, just tramps on a little excursion. We slept in double-decked iron cots with comfortable mattresses, clean sheets, blankets, and pillows. I didn't sleep much. Most of the women were hacking and coughing, and many of them groaning and talking in their sleep. Quite a few of them were climbing in and out of their bunks and going to the bathroom frequently during the night. In the morning, we were given a breakfast of bread, coffee, and cereal. I had to stay in for two hours to help make beds and clean up, and I spent another hour typing cards. Before I left the place, the matron returned my purse and asked if I wanted a job. They need a couple maids over in Bellevue. There's one fairly good job. No, thank you, I told her. I think I can find a job myself. I left the building with two Irish women, Mary and Martha. They were both over 50, spent with work and whiskey. Mary was tall, 
gaunt with a wide, toothless smile and yellow-blue blotches under her eyes from a recent saloon fight. Martha was smaller, with iron-gray hair, pinning, pinned with only one bone hair and pin, and therefore slipping down her neck with an unhealthy high color in her cheeks. I need a drink, Mary said. Let's go over to Devine's and see if he'll give us one on the cuff. We walked into the First Avenue to a bootleg join at the corner of 18th Street, sat down at a table, and waited till the big laughing bartender came over. How's everything at the Ritz? He addressed Mary. I suppose you'll be wanting a drink and you'll pay me this afternoon. And who's your friend? Also, what'll your daughter have? The same as my friend. He set a pint, half pint bottle of whiskey on the table with three glasses and no chaser. Martha filled all three glasses and drained hers at one gulp. I imitated her. There were five other women sitting around, all guests of the municipal lodging house. No, I won't give you another drink till you pay me, the barkeeper scolded good-naturedly when Mary called him back. You've had an eye-opener. Go out and get some money if you want to have anything more to drink. Where do you women get the money to buy drinks, I asked. Where does anybody get the money, asked Martha. We earn it, bag it, steal it, or find it. Well, how do you get your money? Well, let me see. Yesterday I got 90 cents. Me son Tim is a janitor at the flat building, and he gave me 50 cents. And then I went over and seen Mrs. Cohen that I used to work for. And she gave me my lunch and 25 cents. And then an old man that I knew stopped me in the street and gave me 15 cents. And how did you get your money, Mary? Oh, it was easy. Yesterday was payday down at the docks. Me old man is a stevedore for 15 years and the men know me. So I just stood around and some of the boys that worked with my husband gave me some change. I got over two dollars. I thought Devine might give us another one before we have to pay, but since he won't, here's my last quarter. She ordered a pint of Moon and invited us and all the other women to have a drink with her. That batch of women were the most battered and disreputable group I'd ever known. Not one of them had ever been on the road or out of New York. You want to know where I got my money from? Asked a short, roly-poly woman that I had noticed making up to all the men in the place. I earned my money. I always earn my money. Yesterday I worked in a laundry in the basement for a Jewish family. And they've got seven children. I washed, ironed, and scrubbed and got a dollar in car fare. A tall English woman in an old suit with the carefully braided blonde hair round wound her head answered next. A gentleman gave me my money. But not for nothing, girlie. Would you like to meet him? Pegleg Ellen, the heavy, black-eyed, black-haired woman, about forty, who had one foot and walked with the aid of a homemade crutch, said, Got my money. Two dollars and a half on the main stem begging, and it was mostly pennies and nickels. I had to stay out six hours. A sad-looking woman over sixty, Huddled with an old sweater about her shoulders, said, I didn't get any money. I tried to get the day's work, and they sent me over to the hospital, but I couldn't scrub and clean. I've got such an awful cold. The last of the five, a buxom, chattery woman, who had removed, when she came in, a patch from a perfectly normal left eye, said, I make my money by pedaling. I take my matches collar buttons and shoestrings and go in restaurants and stores. I can always earn fifty cents to a dollar a day, but the more I earn, the more I drink. Soon we were joined by a group of men, also from the municipal lodging house, old, stiff, dressed in garments that dirt and many fumigations and washing had made all the same color, the color of poverty. They were a motley crew. Some were crippled, Many of them had teeth missing. All of them needed haircuts. Their old faces were knotted with pain, with disappointment, with weakness. In their eyes was the softness of habitual drinkers. They brought bottles, too, counting out, like the women, 
the pennies and dimes and nickels they had secured by begging or by doing a few odd jobs. I, best, I questioned Ida about a pale younger woman, obviously pres pregnant, who was beginning to rock with merriment at the table with two old wrecks of men. She's a panhandler too, I was told, and she's been pregnant like that for years, but she never has a kid. Wait till she goes to the toilet and you'll see her come back with her stomach in her hand. She'll drink till her money is gone and then she'll disappear and put it on again and go out on the street and look pathetic and beg for the sake of her unborn child. Later I saw many such women on the road, but never have I known so many of them together in one place, off guard, as I did that day in Divine Speakeasy. Some were actually blind, blinkies, some deaf, deafies, some dumb, dummies. The deaf and dumb ones my informer called D and Ds. The armless ones were known as wingies, the legless ones as peggies. The feeble-minded are insane as nuts. With those pronounced tremors, drunk palsied, shakies and, epsilep and epilepsies fitsies, those who have had their legs cut off near the hips and who ride around on a low wheelchair are called wheels. There's a group of professional beggars. There's a group of professional beggars who imitate practically every type of true handicap so well that only experts can detect them, the English woman told me. That woman over there in the corner with the ugly sores on her arms is a blister. She got the sores by putting acid on her arms. She begs money, saying she needs it for a doctor. She pointed out a normal-looking man drinking at the bar. He looks okay, but wait till he gets ready to go on the street. He's a toss-out. He throws with both elbows and one wrist of joint and looks like a freak in a museum. There are others who bind back their hands so that they seem not to have them. These are called hidden hands. Those and the floppers, the ones who pretend being crippled and sit all day before churches and entrances, and the ghosts who assume pale, haggard attitudes and imitate tubercular coughs, makes the most money on the street. But none of them have any of it. They spend it right here. I stayed there and drank continuously until about four o'clock in the afternoon. Then I fell asleep, and when I woke up I was in bed stark naked with a brutal looking man his body was dirty he'd kept his socks on and his sodden toes sticking out the ends were as gray as the socks i sat up where am i i cried in a panic you're with your friends he leered at me have a drink what's this place this is on 10th street near avenue a how did i get here let me out of here my dress and coat were a mess. I examined my purse and found it empty. Everything, letters, a $10 bill which I had hidden away in the lining, and a diary, my most valuable possessions, were gone. I cried and raved and stormed, but the man on the bed only laughed at me. However, when I began to dress, he made no objection, and, despairing of getting any of my things back from him, I dressed and got out as quickly as I could. Sick and miserable, I walked over to Union Square and sat down on the bench, thoroughly ashamed of myself. I had gone a bit too far this time, trying to learn about different types of people. I was completely broke now and had no idea what to do next. I didn't want to go back to the lodging house, and I was in no shape to face my father. I let my head sink to my hands and sat there, completely desolate. I was called back to my surroundings by a voice. It's a chilly evening, said a man I had not noticed sitting at my side. I glanced up quickly. He looked a decent sort, and his remark had evidently been stimulated by sympathy for me. Have you got the price of a cup of coffee? I asked without looking at him. Just about, he answered. Come along. I drank two cups of coffee and ate half a roll. I looked at my benefactor. He was short, bald-headed, dressed in a shabby but spotless gray suit. His mouth was soft like a woman's, but his speech was gruff. Where are you living? he asked. You tell me, I answered, trying to laugh. Where's a good place to live? 
Well, I'd take you home with me, but my woman would throw us both out. I, but I know where you can go if you want to. I have an old friend, Edith Adams, who has a flat down in the village, and she always takes hobos in. Come along down. I started at the word hobos, so it had taken just one day for me to look like a tramp again. I glanced down at the expensive clothes Otto had stolen from me, and which had been in good order the day before. They looked as if I'd slept in them in the jungles. One stocking was torn. My face felt stiff with dirt, but I was too miserable to care. He took my arm and walked me to Christopher Street, near Washington Square, and introduced me to Edith James. Edith, I found a hobo over in Union Square, and she's a, a, she's on the bum and sick. Can you take care of her tonight? Sure. Are you hungry? No, just let me use the bathroom and let me go to sleep, that's all. I remained in bed for over a week. I was horribly sick, with the most terrible gastroenteritis for, ten for days. I remembered being violently cold and almost insane with headaches. Edith Adams and a woman called Christine nursed me night and day. As I grew better, I found I was not a complete stranger to them, they had both known mother when she made speeches in wartime, and they were acquainted with my father. Edith's flat was a combination hobo boarding house, hobo college, bohemian hangout, and certainly a training school for female roughneck anarchists. She had seven rooms and a huge bathroom that must have been made out of a bedroom. The place was carefully furnished, but had a certain rough charm about it. Edith had a way of sticking up radical posters and of wrangling from, wangling from the artists who came in and out of her home some very decent modern paintings. One thing I'll always remember, everything in the place, even the bathroom, had a bed or a studio couch. When I got to know her better, I could see why. Edith was a large woman. Her face was, lar was strongly chiseled and was topped with a bobbed mob of wiry red hair. She was always grinning. She never used cosmetics. She was known to be living with her husband, Mac. She was, he was an engineer on an ocean liner, out of town most of the time, and gave her all of his money. Edith was born in Kansas in the early 80s. She lived there until she was 23, and then went to St. Louis and married a barber. She got to running around to new thought and radical meetings and became interested in the Brotherhood of the Daily Life, which was the first organization of Dr. J. E. Tao. When Howe started his hobo meetings, Edith became one of his group and gathered in all the female hobos in St. Louis. She drifted from socialism to the IWW and then to the anarchist groups. For the past quarter of the century, she had been a good-natured, whole-hearted, full-fledged, roughneck anarchist. With her, the sky was the limit. She disregarded religion and conventionality and whooped it up for the revolution. Edith only lived a few years with her first husband in St. Louis. Then she drifted to Chicago and went to live with Lucy Parsons and hobnobbed with the anarchist group. There she became very active with W.C. Foster and Earl Ford, and was with them when they wrote their famous pamphlet on syndicalism. Soon after that, she went to New York City and located in Greenwich Village. Her house had become one of the most active and popular there. Noted writers, hobos, poets, sculptors, and propagandists immediately became Edith's friends. Among them, Emma Goldman, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Mary English, Anna Strunsky Wallen, Eve Adams, Margaret Sanger, Romany Marie, Eugene O'Neill, Ben Ben, Sadikichi Hartman, Hippolyte Havel, Jig Cook, Bobby Edwards, and Franklin Jordan. Her Christopher Street flat was crowded day and night. She told me, the men, artists, and spittoon philosophers come in to thaw, the f chew the fat, rush the can, sleep off a drunk, and get away from their sweethearts to make some new woman. 
The women come in to take a bath, get away from their lovers, and find someone to buy them a meal or a drink. Most of all, they like my place because they can be natural here. Among her cronies was another anarchist of the same type, a woman called Christine. Christine ran a little tea shop in the villages over in Provincetown Playhouse. Her last name was L, but her place was only known as Christine's. Edith and Christine belonged to that rare type of woman which has a special attraction for intellectual hobos and rebel men and women. Both of these women had sexual appeal, but they had something more valuable, an understanding and a genuine admiration for men and women of talent. It was always easy for a poet or an artist or a writer to tell his plans, dreams, or hopes to them. They all left Edith's pl flat believing in themselves. Not only did the artists, anarchists, free lovers, and labor leaders come to Edith, but also quite a few crooks. The most interesting of the grifters I met there was Mary Ireland, a much photographed mauled buzzer. She was a tall, angular, black-haired, with quiet and aristocratic face. Her pictures were in all of the galleries, and all the store dicks were familiar with them. She specialized in drawing the contents out of women's pocketbooks while they were busy shopping in department stores. Mary Island was a lady, no question about it. While uh, other good, uh, while in New York, she had always lived at the Brevort and other good hotels. She dined and dressed for dinner, and when she went out picking pockets, she always dressed for the part in a somber black coat so that her appearance was that of a widow. When she had worked, she wore very little rouge. We, wore, we were walking one day down Broadway when I happened to mention that I wanted to get a package of safety pins. I'll get them for you, she said quickly. Why do you take a chance on stealing five... Why, uh, why do you take a chance on stealing a cheap five-cent package of pins, I asked. It doesn't make sense to run that risk for a nickel. I steal everything, she said. I enjoy it much more than paying for it. Mary was thrifty. She had spent almost one half of her life in jail in Joliet, Illinois, and Waupon, Wisconsin, in Atlanta, Georgia, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and in Auburn Prison, New York. When I met her, she was out on a $10,000 bond. I just beat this rap, she said. I'm a four-timer. If I'm convicted, I'll be sent to the penitentiary for life as a habitual offender. Her grifting would make a gross of a hundred thousand dollars, she told me without boasting. I've got twenty thousand dollars salted away in first-class bonds and real estate mortgages, she said. When I get another five grand, I'm going to retire. At least one half of her grifting proceeds had gone to her attorneys and fixers. One day she disappeared and I got a little note from her saying, I'm down at the tombs, come and see me. She had picked up, been picked up at Macy's. I intended to go see her but never did and later heard that she was convicted, was sent to Auburn for life as a habitual offender, became unruly there and was transferred to Madawan, the prison for criminally insane. But the other day I met her in Chicago back at her old tricks again. I stayed at Edith's six months that year. She let me earn my room and board by keeping the place clean. The men and women who came in and out of that house fascinated me, and I was learning every day. Christine and Edith had genuine interest in the revolutionary labor movement. If they had any pronounced convictions, it was that they wanted the right to live their lives in their own way. They weren't immoral or unmoral. They paid their way through life. Both were hard workers. Both loved excitement and newcomers. One morning, while we were at the breakfast table, in walked Ina, Franklin Jordan, and Lizzie Davis. I had not seen my sister for some time. She had not grown any taller and did not weigh over a hundred pounds, but her face was glowing with life, and I f her figure was willowy and more fully developed than when I had last seen her. How are all your sweethearts, I asked her. Grand, she said. I've had a lot of them since I've seen you last, and the two I have now you'll love. I'll share them with you. 
Thank you. I'll choose my own lovers, I said somewhat testily. But you have already chosen one of mine, she said triumphantly. Franklin Jordan. Something gripped my heart. How close the currents of life run. First my mother and I had the same lover, and now my sister and I loved the same man, the man I still thought of as one I would eventually choose to be the father of my child. Franklin Jordan and I had our reunion at anarchist mass meeting in the Bronx. The rooms at Edis were always crowded, and there was no opportunity for personal conversation. He asked me, through Ina, to attend the meeting, where he was the principal speaker. There was to be another speaker, but I don't know who it was until Jordan told me after I got there. There were four persons on the program ahead of him, and we sat up in a little side room of the labor lyceum until it was his time to speak. As I'd looked at him, that little room, while we were waiting for him, I felt all of my old desire for him. Suddenly it didn't matter that my little sister had taken him for a, her lover or that he had loved dozens of other women. I wanted him just as I always had. Oh, Jordan, I cried, I want your baby. He smiled. There's scarcely time to do anything about that just now, he said. I think you better go out in front now. There's a great Italian speaker coming on next, Malatini. I started when I heard his name and for the moment forgot all about wanting Jordan. Leaning over and kissing him swiftly, I ran out and took a seat and almost held my breath while I waited for Malatini to come out. He had not changed a bit. The same stern bearded face, the same kind eyes, but now his face was the wrath of God, stirring the people to friendly. It was a mixed audience of Jews, Italians, and Americans, but you didn't have to understand Italian to be moved by his voice any more than you had to understand Italian to enjoy an opera star. He finished amid roaring applause. Jordan was next. He was calm, professorial, logical, reasoning, argumentative, convincing, provocative, soothing. My mind kept running from the speech to the man. I compared him with my first lover, E.A.O., with Lowell Schrader, with Big Otto, whom did I love the most, Malatini or Jordan? Who would I ask to take me home? I knew I could see Jordan any time. I chose to go with Malatini. After the meeting, after the meeting, a group, including all the speakers, went to an Italian comrade's house, where we ate and talked. And it was two o'clock in the morning when we left. You must take me home with you, I whispered to Malatini. Not now. I want to see you some other time, he answered. I was angry and turned to Jordan, who had not heard me whisper. He had a little room on the fifth floor of a 13th Street tenement. It was unfurnished except for a low double bed, a kitchen table, and a bookcase filled with books. A strong box back under his bed was filled with letters. Love letters, he told me later. There was a large whiskey decanter and six whiskey glasses and a few dishes. Ina and I often went together to Jordan's room in the afternoon. He asked us never to come without whiskey, and we never did. Much as I tried to never really be jealous of Ina, she never showed that she was jealous of me, and I learned a great deal from him. Tell me about lesbians, Jordan, I begged him one day. They called them lady lovers on the road. There are so many of them here in the village. What about them? You've had a lot of experiences with them. What makes them that way? Uh, they are God's stepchildren, he said. You know some of them well. Yvonne, the dancer, Mickey Mouse, the prancer, and others. I have had a lot of experience with queers, and they always make me unhappy. My antipathy toward them is not because they are variants. God knows I do not demand everyone be cut from the same pattern, but because they are typically antisocial, selfish, and willing to exploit others. So few of them show a desire to earn an honest living. Many of them are willing to get by at the expense of anybody. Outside the dope fiends, I don't know any group which is so many chiselers, racketeers, and petty larceny grifters. 
Their lift sins are cheap sins. Their antisocialness is petty. Few of them have any courage in their love affairs or in their method of procuring a living. Homosexuality, as I see it, is largely artificial. Not only the sexual expression of lesbians and male homosexuals, but their walk and talk and entire behavior are artificial. I have known men who, in civil life, were absolutely feminine, and who, in a few months with a group of normal men or in jail, have lost every vestige of their femininity. I've also seen great many women who were coarse and masculine, with hair on their chests and so on, become very ladylike. Their transversion is, of course, another evidence of their infantilism. The worst feature about them is that they are constantly on the make. They are like dope fiends, not content to use dope themselves. They have to proselyte. They have to teach everyone they come in contact with. If they don't do this, it doesn't matter, for since they do not reproduce themselves, they are not important. The men and women I knew around Jordan, and those who came to Edith Adams flat, and the things they said and did would fill a book. By far the most colorful, fascinating, and terrible man who came there was Sir Thousand Loves, as Edith called him. He was a poet, author, actor, entertainer. Certainly he was an arch lover. He was the author of two books of poetry, several novels, two volumes of essays, a history of sex wor workshop, oh, a history of what? sex worship. He edited... He rented Edith's front room. It had an entrance directly on the street. In appearance, he was not much of average height, rather fragile thin hair and mustache growing lighter with age. His profile was rather good, but on full view, his face pouted. However, his eyes were gray blue and very personal. Ina had an experience with him and was very proud of it. I hadn't been in his presence more than ten minutes because, or when he started to moan and sigh and claw and weep. Don't work so fast, poet. I said, I'm makeable. You can have me. Your number is going to be a thousand one, said Edith, who happened to come in. I'm willing, I continued, but first tell me about the first thousand. Sir Thousand Loves is drunk most of the time, and when he's sober, he is colossally egotistical. But as far as I hear, he's never been loyal to any of his women. How does he do it? Ask him, she said, as she left us. How do you win your women, poet? What women? You're the only woman I ever loved in my life. You're beautiful. He actually refused to commit himself or acknowledge that I had ever that he had ever had another love in his life. My experience with Thir Sir Thousand Loves was not worth telling about. He made love to me with words. That was all. Jordan I saw much of. There were a few more men that came and went, but none of them mattered much. I had Malatini on my mind. I met him again the 11th of November in a meeting on East Broadway. He was friendly as ever, and as impersonal as ever, but I was determined not to be put off again. I went to him after the meeting. I will not let you go, I said. You must take me home with you. I live a long way out in Patterson, he protested. I don't care if you live in Philadelphia, I said desperately. I'm going with you. I paid my own fare on the train. He did not live in Patterson, but four miles beyond it, in an old two-story farmhouse, at the end of a little side road. He was silent as we walked in the cool October moonlit night. I hung to his arm and pled with him. Talk to me, tell me you love me, I cried. He patted my hand as it hung on his arm. I'm afraid you do not understand what I'm trying to do, he said. Love, as you use the word, has no place in my life. Tell me what you are trying to do. You made me love you, I said. He stopped and looked at me. His face was pale and stern. I made you love me? What do you mean by that? I winced and was ashamed of that stupid, hypocriti hypocritical, typically feminine remark. I'm sorry, I said. That was a ridiculous thing for me to say. Then he smiled. 
What do you want from me, Bertha? He asked. I was silent. Just what did I want? Surely not sex. Yes, maybe it was. Perhaps I was just amorous. It wasn't a child I wanted from him. I knew that I wanted a baby by Jordan. I didn't want to have a home with Malatini or to live with him either. I was aware that he couldn't or wouldn't support me. What I didn't want from what didn't what did I want from him? What did I want from the men to whom I was drawn? They had experience for me. That was it. Instinctively, I felt that Malatini had something for me that no other man in the world had, but I could not answer him. Do you love me, Bertha? He went on. Yes, I said, my voice low now, and we walked a dozen steps over the rough road with moonlight making queer shadows along the fields before he spoke again. Do you love the people, the working class? He asked. Like a nun taking a vow, I put my hand on my heart and I raised my eyes and I answered, I do. Then come on with me. It was six o'clock in the morning when we arrived at the little farmhouse. He introduced me to a woman, her husband, three children and a man of 20, all black-eyed Italians. He spoke to them in his own language, apparently convincing them I was a friend. Then they smiled at me and gave us breakfast. Later he took me to the barn and up in a hayloft that was fitted up as a study and chemical laboratory. Here he told me what he was doing, and I felt as though I were being initiated into a secret order as indeed, in fact, I was. Bertha, he said solemnly, I belong to a small group who are trying to bring about a revolution in Spain and Italy and in America. We've made progress slowly in America. You know why? We have not been able to develop an intelligent, courageous type of female revolutionist. The American women, as I see them, want lovers, companionship, a good time. They can love a man, but not men, Bertha. A man, but not men, Bertha. Can you learn to love men, the people, the working class, more than you do a man or a few men, more than you love your family and more than you love yourself? For a moment, I did not know how to answer him, how to tell him what I wanted to say in a way that would convince him. Then I took his hand in mine and kissed it. Let me help you, I begged. Let me prove to you that I am loyal and I will do everything for the people. We rested together quietly all day. He told me about his life. He had a wife and four children in Italy. He had been in the revolutionary movement since he was 14, more than 30 years. He had, jailed, he had been jailed and was now a political exile from Italy. Finally, he was convinced that I could be of use to his movement. Bertha, he said, if you really want to serve people, you can. I'm going to entrust you with very important work. You go home and we will come for you next Wednesday at four o'clock. Tuesday night, I stayed with Ina and we talked over our plans. She read a number of letters from a member, from a mother who was out from, from, she read a few num letters from mother who was out of home colony on a prison reform crusade. Frank and Margaret were in St. Louis working. Mother said that she was tired of traveling and wanted to go back to the soil. She hoped to buy a little ranch in North Dakota. I want to have a place where my children can come when they get tired, she wrote. I wrote Ina that I was going to Chicago the next day with Malatini on an important mission. She begged me to share my secret with her. If you were going to do anything really serious, Bertha, I want to be with you and we should tell mother about it. But I told her I must go alone. The next morning I went back to Edith's and made preparation to go. Malatini was to come at four, Sir Thousand Loves, Jordan, and a group of hobo, women hobos came in earlier, however, and we started to drink. I had drunk very little since my unpleasant experience with the drink with municipal lodging house women, but this day I had started in heavy. 
By four o'clock I had passed out of the picture, I guess, and was laying in the bed with thousand loves in Jordan when Malatini came. He shook me gently, and I got out of bed, bleary-eyed, staggering, sick. I mumbled. He stood there quietly, watching me. Even in my drunken state, I could see the disappointment and pain in his face. Then he left. And suddenly my head cleared as though someone had struck me with a blow of a blow with a wet towel. I looked at the bed and saw Jordan and Thousand Loves sleeping. Their drunken faces were hideous. In a sudden fury I picked up a reading lamp, tore it from its socket, and struck Jordan over the head with it. Besides myself, I began to beat Thousand Loves with my fist. You miserable, vile, drunken creatures, see what you've made me do, I screamed. Three days later, I picked up the New York Times and read on the front page, 30 prominent citizens poisoned at a banquet at the College Club of Chicago, distinguished Catholic layman and archbishop poisoned at $7 a plate dinner. The first on the menu was a cocktail and then an appetizer. The third was soup. A few minutes after the guests ate the soup, a hundred of them showed symptoms of acute poisoning. Police suspect a young anarchist called Jeans. He appeared, and he disappeared immediately after the soup had been prepared. Police found in his locker letters from Malatini, who was suspected of engineering the plot. And I remembered, you do not understand. Now I understood. The next day, I had a three-word letter from Otto in France, in San Francisco. Hello, beautiful. Otto. Enclosed were $300 bills. Suddenly, I knew I wanted to be out of New York. Hitchhiking or riding in a freight car wouldn't take me away fast enough, and I bought some clothes and a first-class ticket to Chicago. To what or whom, I did not know. That is the end of chapter 11. Thank you. Please like and subscribe.